Hello and welcome to our podcast, Art in Conversation. I'm India. And I am Scarlett, and we are from 108 Fine Art Gallery. In this episode, we will be speaking to Jane Winfrey about her role as picture specialist at Bonham's Auctioneers. We hear about her artistic influences and how she started out her career in an auction house. I grew up in Cambridgeshire, um, but I came up to work in Leeds. I've left Leeds to go away and work, and then I've come back when I got married. So I keep coming back to Leeds. I was at Leeds University as well, um, but I do like Leeds as a city. And it's a good place to be, and it's very vibrant, and there's lots going on in the arts, whether it's opera, um, you know, the art gallery, Leeds University, there's a lot going on. And what did you study at Leeds? Um, Archaeology and history. Oh wow. Yep. So gradually moved into the 21st century. I did an (laughs) MA um, later on at Leeds University when when I got married um, and in sculpture studies. So that was, I loved that. That was very good. I think I've always been interested in in the arts um, from growing up and being quite little. Uh, I'm definitely a visual person. I love children's books with good illustrations in them. I think illustration is totally, or illustrators are very underrated. Um, and and but I love the countryside as well. And I always saying to my children, you can you can never beat nature, whether it's the colours that are in the flowers or the greens, or whether it's a seashell or an acorn. Um, so I think. Uh, I grew up in the countryside, so I think that's very much part of my um, ethos in whatever I do. Academically, um, you know, from school to university, um, into the working world, came back to do an MA quite late, and therefore I think benefited hugely um, because I really wanted to do it and I was really interested. And I've been lucky in that sometimes I feel I've been in the right place at the right time for jobs. Um, you know, whether it was working for a dealer, an auction house, um, or a stint with Leeds Museums and Galleries, and also freelance with Bradford uh, Cartwright Hall Art Gallery. Um, And everything is just part of learning. I think that's the wonderful thing about working in the arts, you never stop learning. Were you brought up in a household where art was influential? I think I definitely was. Um, My um, parents, bought antiques uh, to furnish the house because it was cheaper than buying new furniture. Um, but my, both my grandparents had um, houses which were old and also contained wonderful things. My Yorkshire granny had lived in an old rectory and going up the stairs and along her sort of landing um, were loads of rather dour Yorkshire portraits of family members. But she also had collections of um, 18th century enamel snuff boxes or silver vinaigrettes uh, or a silver cow creamer. You know, she had a fascinating um, items all over the house. And then my Cambridgeshire grandparents, again, they lived in, in a beautiful house that looked like a doll's house, but they were very country sports. So that was full of um, portraits of horses and dogs and fake Thomas Sidney Coopers. Um, and I think that somebody somewhere along the line had a little bit of a mental aberration and bought from auction this sweet little 19th century painting of a seamstress sewing by candlelight. Um, It's a continental painting and I was always enchanted by this because the woman has fallen asleep with the work on her lap Um, and now that hangs on my wall. So uh, yes, always I grew up with lovely things. And were there artists in your family? Um, No, actually there's not. They were very creative people. My Yorkshire granny made a lot of uh, her own clothes. She dressed very artistically. Um, It was fascinating watching her get ready in the mornings. Um, And so she made a lot of clothes for herself and for us and also fantastic toys. And my, one of my sisters is actually a potter as well. So I think everyone's always been creative, but they've never done it as a profession. I love, I do love making things and um, 
I've almost lost that element of concentration. I think you get sort of sucked into work and I think it is a lovely experience when you sort of do get into a studio and you do try and, and make things. And when I have a bit more time, one of my aims is to work a bit with my, my sister Catherine in her pottery, in her studio, and actually do some decorating of pots with her um, and take some time out from you know, looking at paintings, but being more creative. Uh, what led you to pursuing a career in auctioneering? And how did it all begin? Hmm, I think I think some of that is a little bit the element of luck that sometimes comes into our careers, because when I graduated from university, I went to work for it with a dealer, an antique dealer who specialised in ceramics. And then I realised that um, Although it was fun and we did London fairs and I learned a lot, but sometimes sitting in a shop can be a little bit dull. And uh, although you might be researching certain items, it would, I wanted to see more things basically. So I applied to auction houses and um, the auction house that responded, I, I, I wrote to everybody. And the one that responded first uh, was Phillips Auctioneers in Leeds. And I applied to that because I knew Leeds, because I'd been at Leeds University. And um, they, their picture department was expanding at that point and uh, they wanted an assistant, a trainee assistant. So I took the job, again, very fortuitous, really. And yeah. then worked for a couple of years there before um, going, there were a couple of jobs going in London in the picture department in Phillips, so I went to work in the London 19th century paintings department. When I got married and moved back to Yorkshire, I then did an MA, which was one of the best things I ever did. But then I worked with museums and galleries. And again, that's a fantastic learning curve. Um, partly because working for a local authority is actually quite frustrating compared to working in a commercial world where you, you don't have time to take your time. Um, you've, got a, you've got deadlines all the time and you're seeing a lot of kit. So you have to work quite speedily. Um, and so actually after a bit of work there, it, it was fortuitous to get back into the auction world and work for Bonhams again. Oh, actually I did do a quick course at uh, the V&A um, because I knew I wanted to get into an auction house at that point. So I thought, well, I'll do this course at the V&A and then I've got with the degree in that I've got some credibility and I can you know just write to all the auction houses and it was different when I was applying you you wrote and sent your CV now it's very much you're going for internships or you need to get on the course at Christie's um, it was a different ball game when I started out it, it was probably a simpler world there's so much more um, publicity about auction houses and world records being smashed and interesting artists, you know, or sort of Damien Hirst selling part of his collection with Sotheby's. There's so much going on and so much publicity around it all now that it, it looks so glamorous that I think there are more people interested in applying. But there is a limited amount of jobs. So, you know, I think it's a lot tougher to get in than when I first started, where you could start at a very junior level. And my husband started as a porter and then became a trainee jewellery specialist. Um, there's, I think there's less opportunities and you need to be better qualified probably than we were. It seems to be that um, maybe it's the internet and making everything more accessible. Um, yes, I, it's phenomenal. I mean, the whole social media world has opened things up hugely, hasn't it? And I think it's been fascinating during lockdown that um, art, you know, that Freeze has been online and now there's software so that you can, um, if you feel tempted to buy a painting, you can now try it in your own home in a virtual way. Um, I think the art market has just moved on such a lot and it's so accessible to everybody. There's far more private buyers now at, at auction level than when I first started out, when it was predominantly trade. You know, when I yes. first, 
started, sale rooms were absolutely packed because everybody went to the sale. Now they're virtually empty. Wow. Yeah, so such a change, does it? that create a, a different atmosphere within the auction houses then? Yes, I, I think it is for uh, sort of regular sales. I think when you've got the specialist sales or evening sales, you always have you know a, a good audience there. But also, a lot of people um, like to remain anonymous. So for them, you know, bidding online or by telephone, it's um, always it. They're going to that's a more discreet way of bidding for them. So it, it, it has all changed. What does a day in the life of a picture specialist look like? For me, being a regional specialist, um, I, I some days I can be out on the road all day. We cover, uh, we're based at Bowcliffe Hall near Weatherby, so, but we go up to the Scottish borders and I can be down in Lincolnshire or Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire. We cover a huge area. So I could be on calls and doing valuations in you know, multiple locations. Um, we also do valuation days at the office and valuation days out in hotels and then we have in, might have insurance valuations to do or probate valuations. There's a lot more research now. I think we are, valuations are a much higher standard than when I first started out where you just used to name the artist, do description and the medium. Now we do a lot, a lot more research about the background of the painting, where it's come from, if we know it, what gallery it came from, and what its history has been, you know, if it's been through several different auction houses, or if it's been, um, you know, in the family since 18, you know, 1860, um, you know, which is always fantastic when you get lovely private paintings like that. So that's all, all the very sort of interesting part of it. But the downside is for, well, this isn't really a downside, but I no longer have sales. So if I want to go to a sale, then I would go to London or our Edinburgh sale room to be part of the sale room experience there, whether I'm on a telephone line or just helping in any way possible in the sale. But it's a very good way. I think you remember far more what prices things are making when you're in the sale room than when you just look at the results sometimes afterwards. How you have to add more detail when you're evaluating, is there a reason for this? Um, I think all our standards are higher than they, than they were. I think uh, catalogues, printed catalogues, became like reference books at one point, you know, that we were putting so much history in behind the paintings. It also um, helps if you mention, I mean, if a painting got stolen, to have a better description, which tells you about the labels that are on the back, um, you know, that says what sort of frame it's in. Um, it's then much easier to um, sort of locate it if it does turn up again, because you've got all this extra evidence. We, like we say now where a painting is signed, if it's top left, bottom left, or sort of painted on a barrel somewhere in the middle of the painting. Um, all those details um, I think are much more helpful um, and it, it also helps when you go back to evaluation with all that detail in it as well to update it. If it, all that information is there, if somebody comes to me in two or three years time, I've got so much information and we illustrate things now as well and take details, illustrations of the labels, the back of the paintings. Um, so it's much easier to update it at a later date if they come back to you. We, we produce catalogues, you know, that are like reference books and now we will continue to catalogue in that way but I think since lockdown and sales going online I think we, there won't be so many printed catalogues out there anymore because it's all online now and people have retrained themselves over this period to look more at the internet so I think for certain the, the best sales and the best collections they'll always have a printed catalogue but I think a lot of the regular sales will no longer have them and you know 80 year old clients are now using zoom you know and <laughs> um, they're able to, to sort of hold a hold a camera and show 
what they want valuing around the room. So uh, everybody has moved on, I think, in four months, hugely in terms of technology. And you were saying before that you obviously collect, you collect your own artwork. What kind of thing are you into at the moment? What is your oh, I'm favorite, very eclectic. favorite piece? I'm very eclectic. I, I, thanks to my pottery sister, I do collect quite a lot of contemporary potters. Um, so I love that. Um, but I, I also love printmaking as well. I love prints. And I particularly collect uh, an artist called Paul Drury in prints, who actually is the son of a sculptor I got very interested in, 19th century, early 20th century sculptor called Alfred Drury, who I did my MA dissertation on and um, I need to do some more work on in the future. So, um, so I love sculpture as well. You know, I can be tempted on so many things. I have to have to stop myself, really. What aspect of your job do you enjoy the most? Um, I think it's definitely the research side. Um, I, I love it when you, you get a painting and you can do, you can track down previous owners. And also, I, I think I like going into libraries and archives um, because sometimes you're, it, these things haven't been looked at for about 50, 60 years. And then you, you find out so much for an, from an original letter that somebody's written or extraordinarily people in the 19th, 18th century, they wrote inventories of everything they had in the house. And we saw one beautiful portrait, um, 18th century portrait in London a few years ago that came from a Yorkshire house. And I went to the archive, um, I'm just trying to think which, I think it was the North Yorkshire archive. And um, it had, uh, there was an inventory, a book, uh, which the person who owned the house and owned the paintings had written down in precisely everything he had and what room it was in. And in fact, this portrait did have a companion portrait um, as well. We sold the male, but the female, I can't remember where that is. I think it actually might be in a public gallery. What has been your most memorable discovery um, as an auctioneer? Now, this is an interesting question and, and this caused me quite a, a lot of time thinking actually because you everyone thinks it's going to be the most valuable thing that you've ever had is probably going to be the most memorable and um, sometimes it isn't because sometimes uh, the smaller more academic things are more intriguing um, but one painting that really sticks in my my mind because of the circumstances really was a beautiful painting we were called out to a house because they had re recently had thefts um, and a lot of the nice paintings have been stolen um, and so they said you know could you come and look at the rest of the paintings and we we went to have a look and there was this beautiful painting that the burglars had missed um, that was of a, a girl in profile, uh, in classical dress, and she's seated and holding in front of her a bowl of honey. It's 19th century painting, a bowl of honey, and the honey is attracting butterflies. So it was this beautiful painting, and I knew as soon as I saw it, I thought, that is absolutely gorgeous. We need to get this out of the house so that nobody comes back for this one. And I didn't even know who the artist was. Um, it was a female artist um, called Sarah Paxton Ball Dobson. And so we got it out of the house and we got it back uh, to the office. And I sent off a picture as soon as I could to our 19th century specialist and I was just seeing this lovely painting. And uh, the artist was in fact an American woman artist who was born in the 1840s. And uh, she trained, she, I think she was born in Philadelphia and trained in Pennsylvania and um, then Paris and so she was quite it was it's unusual to find a 19th century American female artist and uh, they did a bit more work on the painting and it had been exhibited um, in 18 in the 1890s um, and in Chicago and then the artist had a retrospective in New York in 1911 and the painting had been in there 
but we didn't know what to put on this painting in terms of a price because nothing you know, about six prices for this artist, you know, nothing had really come up, but it was so pretty. I think we put something like 10 to 15 or 15 to 20,000 on it. Anyway, it, it ended up making 70,000 pounds. And it was just because it was a bit of a winner because the subject was so lovely, but it was, was also a female artist and Amer an American female artist, you know, who trained in Paris. And it just ticked all the right boxes really so sometimes you remember something like that more than something that made hundreds of thousands because sometimes those jobs are quite easy you know you know, you know what they're going to make because the artists are well known and so they're very predictable so sometimes it's the unpredictable that you remember a bit more what would the 18 year old jane winfrey think of what you have achieved and the path you have taken um, I think that she'd probably find it quite interesting, <laughs> but she'd also probably say have a, yes. bit more, have a bit more confidence and do a bit more creative stuff as well yourself. What advice would you give to young or new upcoming artists or those who are wanting to come into auctioneering? Um, I think I think for young artists, it's just to have confidence and believe you can do it. Um, and I think sometimes with artists, it's, it's making sure you're in the right place at the right time. Um, and for going into the auction world, um, I think, you know, one of the best things I, I have done all through my career is get to as many exhibitions as you possibly can go to or galleries because you learn so much from looking at things. And it's, I mean, it's been not being great in lockdown really because there is nothing like looking at a physical object or a physical painting and looking at the brush strokes or seeing how somebody modeled a piece of sculpture um so it's if you look hard enough um, somebody who, who was in um, our head of old master paintings when i was working at phillips in london he said he said look at something long enough and you will find the answers Thank you for listening to Art in Conversation with Jane Winfrey. If you missed any previous podcasts, these can be found on our website www.108fineart.com slash podcasts. Follow us for regular podcasts and give our show a like, share and review. See you next time.